Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will now come to order. The chair recognizes himself, that would be me, for a five-minute opening statement. As you all know, this subcommittee had originally planned to hold this hearing last October. I'm grateful we were able to reschedule this important hearing and appreciate the witnesses. I appreciate you all very much for rescheduling it as well. I know that that could not have been uh, easy, and I do apologize for the fact that we were supposed to do it earlier and we weren't able to get to it. And uh, thank you all for your flexibility and your understanding. Organized athletics, especially for our children, is invaluable to the culture of our country. Sport is instrumental in helping to teach young people the values of teamwork and self-esteem. From soccer to football, tennis to badminton, lacrosse, and my favorite, swimming, over 60 million children participate in youth sports, le sports leagues. Some children start their athletic journey before they go to kindergarten. They pour their hearts and souls into it, dedicating countless hours in the pursuit of mastering their chosen sport. A young athlete hoping to excel at the highest levels as part of the modern Olympic movement may have to put in the same training hours a week as the average American does at work, and in many cases, more than the average American does at work. It is because of these fierce, comp uh, these fierce competitors and the extensive network of youth leagues that the United States proudly claims the most Olympic medals in the modern Olympic movement at over 3,100, 1,100 more than the Germans who come in a distant second with 2,000 medals. With this tremendous sports success our country enjoys, we owe it to the athletes to ensure that they can compete in a safe and abuse-free environment. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily the case. As a member of the subcommittee in 2018, I remember listening to the testimony about the tragic and horrific episodes of sexual abuse documented at USA Gymnastics. This repugnant occurrence was perhaps the worst case of athletic abuse seen in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. Congress came together following that incident to charter the U.S. Center for Safe Sport to ensure those abhorrent events never happen again. The Center is a 501c3 nonprofit responsible for investigating and resolving abuse and misconduct reports in sports leagues affiliated with U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Currently, Safe Sport covers about 11 million individuals. The Center has a tall order, but it is critical that we have functioning, transparent, and effective organization that seriously takes on its mission <coughs> to protect athletes from abuse. Safe Sport has, has a challenging role to play in protecting children against abuse. Like any new organization, it will need to grow and rectify mistakes that inevitably will occur. As safe, as safe Sport learns and builds up its protocols, it may also need legislative changes. I'm well aware of the criticisms levied against Safe Sport, particularly regarding its lack of transparency. Just a few weeks ago, the Commission on the State of the U.S. of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics, tasked by Congress to find areas to improve the Olympic movement, stated about Safe Sport: "Quote." A decision not to furnish us with requested financial documents detailing spending as well as those covering certain safety policies reflect a lack of transparency built into the structure of the current system, one that hinders the movement's accountability to Congress, end quote. This is concerning. I'm also concerned about reports my office has received regarding youth sports leagues disaffiliating from their national governing bodies to avoid coach training and background check requirements imposed by Safe Sport. This is very troubling given that Safe Sport was created to protect athletes from abuse and instead it may be inadvertently driving athletes into more opaque leagues that lack the reporting and training requirements of Safe Sport. The commission interviewed national governing body participants who told them, quote, a coach can move to, an, to unsanctioned competitions, still be participating in the sport basically every single day, end quote. One person even told the commission, quote, the two biggest offenders that I know of are still coaching. Nothing ever happened to them, end quote. 
We must find a way to close these loopholes. This oversight hearing is a great bipartisan opportunity to check in with SafeSport and some of the national governing bodies regarding how well SafeSport is functioning and how overall athlete safety can be improved. Everyone in this room is in agreement. The physical and mental health of our young athletes is paramount. We owe them that. Today we have testifying Jerese Colon, Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, Craig Kress, Chief Executive Officer of USA Softball, Mana Shim, Chair U.S. Soccer Federation Participant Safety Task Force, and Nicole Deal, Senior Vice President for Security and Athlete Safety, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Appreciate y'all being here. With that, I end my opening statement and yield to the ranking member for her five-minute opening statement, Ms. Castor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for, for organizing this hearing and, and welcome and thank you to all of our witnesses who are here, are here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I have spoken on several occasions about our shared goal to ensure that the Center for Safe Sport is fulfilling its critical mission to keep athletes safe. Uh, as the co-chair of the Soccer Caucus, uh, uh, and I was brought to the Soccer Caucus because of my daughter's involvement in youth sports. Uh, she grew up as my other daughter also was involved in athletics, and I, am, I think we all understand what participation in athletics as you grow up can mean to being healthy and well. And as a parent uh, and as an athlete, you, uh, you deserve to do that in a safe environment. So I'm hopeful that this hearing will be productive and meaningful, and we can continue to keep athletes safe across the country. We've got to do better. The U.S. Center for Safe Sport author was authorized by Congress in 2018. It receives and responds to reports of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse from participants in sports associated with more, the more than 50 national governing bodies and grassroot team, grassroots teams that are part of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. This mandate extends to millions of athletes, including many children uh, who deserve an opportunity to play sports in a safe, nurturing environment that allows everyone to participate and thrive. Unfortunately, we need entities like Safe Sport now more than ever. Since its inception, reports of abuse and misconduct made to Safe Sport have increased by nearly 2,000%. Safe Sport was created as an independent body to provide victims of abuse with a clear path to report misconduct and, pro and proce a process to hold abusers accountable. However, the committee has heard serious concerns from stakeholders uh, and just weeks ago from the Commission on, this, on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics about whether Safe Sport's processes align with its safety-focused mission. We also have, owe a debt of gratitude to U.S. soccer and folks like Ms. Shim who have uh, detailed uh, the abuse and the failures of safe sport to really respond in an adequate way. These concerns include a lack of clarity about safe sports jurisdiction, poor communication with complainants regarding investigation status, the need for trauma-informed athlete-centered and athlete survivor centered policies, excessively long investigations, a high percentage of cases uh, closed administratively without clear justification, and uncertainty about the ability of NGBs to establish safety measures concerning individuals involved in active or past safe sport investigations. Safe sport uh, has a challenging job to be sure but it can only succeed if it operates in a way that inspires trust in athletes, uh, the athletes who are in, in need of help. And we in Congress want to help it succeed. I want to acknowledge that we would not be here today uh, discussing this important issue without the individuals who bravely came forward with their experiences of abuse to demand better protection, not only for themselves, but for all athletes. Safe Sport was set up first and foremost to serve and protect the athlete. And if the process is falling <laughs> short, it must be fixed. We must ensure a transparent and accountable system for all athletes and all stakeholders. That includes a strong, effective Center for Safe Sport that has adequate resources to respond to the thousands of reports that it receives. It also includes responsible and accountable NGB leadership 
coaches, teams, training staff, and anyone who works with our athletes. And it requires everyone involved in the Olympic movement to work together to prevent abuse and to respond decisively when it occurs. Thank you all uh, for being here to share your perspectives and your expertise. I look forward to a productive conversation today. And I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Rogers of Washington. Thank you. Five minutes. Thank you, Chair Griffith. Nothing is more important than the safety and well-being of our children. When we place them in the care of coaches and school administrators, we trust that they will be protected. When they're practicing, training, and competing in the sports they love, we expect coaches, trainers, and volunteers are all keeping our children's safety front and center. When they're on the field or in the pool or on the slopes, their only con concern should be competing and being the best athletes they can be. It is in these environments that they learn important life lessons of hard work, resiliency, mental fortitude, and teamwork. That's why I was disturbed and heartbroken, like all of my colleagues, after learning of the horrifying abuses inflicted on our young Olympic gymnast. What these young women went through is unimaginable and should never happen again. These unspeakable acts materialized under a system that failed athletes who were talented and privileged enough to compete in the Olympic and Paralympic Games. I remember when former Olympic athletes came before Congress and shared their stories. The hearing was painful to watch and rocked many of us to our cores, but it was necessary. And I'm still grateful to those brave woman, women who, whose courage is a testament to the mission we have before us today. <coughs> Congress set out to make sure that abuses against our young athletes competing in the Olympic system never happens again. <coughs> Six years ago, we created the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, the independent organization responsible for investigating and resolving reported abuses. The center has the sole and exclusive authority to investigate and resolve sexual misconduct claims. Parents across the country are counting on the center to protect their children so that they can compete in a safe and healthy environment. Today, Safe Sport has the scope and authority to investigate any reports of misconduct for the more than 11 million individuals throughout the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. It is no small feat, as the center has, been, has seen misconduct and abuse reports increase year over year. We must put athlete safety first, which means we must find what is working at the center and fix the issues that are not. As the center itself has already publicly acknowledged at a hearing on the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics, some of the criticisms against it are warranted. The center has stated that at times its process was, quote, not trauma-informed, that there was poor communication, or it simply took too long. It also said, quote, it is committed to continuous quality improvement. These are all issues the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics documented in its report released earlier this month. Among the Commission's other findings, it found the Center needs to improve its trust with athletes, clarifying its reporting process and better maintain its database. I welcome its commitment to do better and know this subcommittee is equally in invested in seeing safe sport improve for the benefit of America's children and young athletes. I ask my colleagues to join in today's hearing to bring safe sports outstanding issues to light in a productive way so that we can find solutions. To the millions of America's athletes and young and their parents, we hear you and we will work to make sure that all young athletes from youth sports to the Olympics are safe, healthy, and thriving. I look forward to today's discussion and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is about keeping our athletes safe. We should have zero tolerance for misconduct of any kind in sports. The health, dignity, well-being, and performance of millions of athletes across our country depend on the strength of the systems in place to keep athletes safe from abuse. And I hope that today's hearing brings more awareness to this issue and the improvements that must be made 
whether we're talking about little kids playing in local soccer teams or high school gymnasts, Division I college wrestlers, or competitors in Olympic-level track and field events, sports should be a place of safety, respect, and fair competition, and athletes of all ages deserve nothing less. Unfortunately, numerous scandals involving abuse of athletes across sports demonstrate the need for action and constant vigilance. By 2016, several high-profile cases of a sexual abuse of minor athletes in the USA Gymnastics, USA Swimming, uh, and um, USA Taekwondo programs had come to light, and we watched as hundreds of USA gymnasts courageously came forward to detail decades of harrowing abuse by a team doctor, Larry Nasser. Press reports and independent investigations expose systematic failures to respond to reports of Nasser's abuse and attempts to cover it up. And amidst these shocking revelations of abuse and the many ways athletes' attempts to speak out were overlooked or discredited and suppressed by the very people whose job it was to protect them, Congress established a U.S. Center for Safe Sports in 2017. Now, Congress gave safe sport exclusive jurisdiction over allegations of sexual misconduct and discretionary authority to investigate other forms of misconduct, including physical and emotional abuse. It can impose sanctions against perpetrators of all types of abuse, and safe sport is also required to provide education, outreach, training, and annual compliance audits of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Olympic Committee and national governing bodies responsible for managing individual sports within the U.S. Its creation was a significant step forward in addressing abuse, harassment, and misconduct in sports. But more than 11 million athletes in the Olympic movement count on safe sport for their safety, but more must be done to improve safe sport and better protect our nation's athletes. Athletes and other stakeholders have raised serious concerns about safe sports policies and procedures in investigating and resolving reports of sexual abuse. They've also questioned whether claimants are being sufficiently heard and protected. Athletes and NGBs who have reported abuse allegations to safe sport have also raised concern about a lack of transparency and poor communication as investigations are ongoing. Investigations can take years to be resolved, and, and we've uh, heard from stakeholders that very little information is shared, even at the conclusion of the case. So part of the challenge is that Safe Sport is charged with managing a ballooning caseload with insufficient resources. In 2018, Safe Sport opened roughly 300 investigations uh, relating to complaints from 38 different NGBs. Four years later, in 2022, Safe Sport was receiving an average of more than 100 new reports of alleged misconduct every week. So as the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics concluded in a report it released earlier this month, Safe Sports funding level is insufficient to meet its mandate to ensure athlete safety. The Commission also found that Safe Sports broad jurisdiction over everything from grassroots youth sports to high performance Olympic level athletics inhibits its ability to effectively protect our athletes. The Commission recommended that Safe Sport be fully independent from the USOPC and reform its investigation practices, including the way it handles cases where athletes are reluctant to participate. Athlete trust in safe sports process is critical for its success, and we must ensure their safety through an accountable and transparent system. And Congress needs to be clear about what we expect from safe sport and understand what we can do to improve athlete safety. So safe sport is a critically important institution that has to succeed. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how we can come together to improve safe sport so athletes at every level can participate in sports free from abuse and misconduct and focus on their fair play competition and high performance. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the remainder of his time. That concludes members' opening statements. The chair reminds members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members' written and opening statements will be made part of the record, and if you would please provide those to the clerk promptly so we can get it into the record. Uh, we want to thank our witnesses for being here today and taking the time to testify for, before the committee. You will have the opportunity to give an opening statement, followed by a round of questions from members. Our witnesses today, as I stated previously, are Jerice uh, Colin, uh, Colin, uh, sorry, Cologne, uh, the CEO of U.S. Center for Safe Sport, Nicole Deal, Senior Vice President for Security and Athlete Safety, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Monash, Ms. Mona Shim, Chair, U.S. Soccer Federation Participant Safety Task Force. And Mr. Craig Cress, CEO, USA Softball. 
We appreciate you being here today, and I look forward to hearing from you. As you're aware, the subcommittee is holding uh, an oversight hearing, and when we do so, we have the practice of taking that testimony under oath. Does anyone have an objection to testifying under oath? Seeing no objection, um, if each person would stand if they're able, and uh, I will advise you that you are also entitled to be advised by counsel pursuant to House rules. Does anyone wish to be to, to advised by their legal counsel during the testimony today? Again, I see no one uh, requesting that. If you would please raise your right hands. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Okay. Seeing the witnesses answered in the affirmative, you are now sworn in and under oath, subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. With that said, you can sit down, and we uh, will now recognize Ms. Cologne for five minutes to give her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Griffith, Ranking Member Castor, Chairwoman McMorris Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, for inviting the U.S. Center for Safe Sport to discuss the progress that we're making towards changing sport culture, as well as the work that we have ahead of us. When the center opened our doors seven years ago, we were faced with a daunting task to undo, undo years of inaction, restore faith in a movement that had failed too many, and finally hold abusers and the organizations that enabled them accountable. Our work has been a catalyst for change. Reports of abuse and misconduct have increased by more than 2,000% since opening. People are coming forward with their stories because they know that the center is a resource for them. In our first year, we received roughly 300 reports of abuse and misconduct, and last year we received 7,500. To date, the center has received more than 25,000 reports. The names of more than 2,000 individuals are now listed on our centralized disciplinary database. It's a first of its kind public resource listing individuals who have been restricted or banned from sport, which any parent, local sports league, youth serving organization, or employer can easily access on our website. We've delivered more than 5 million trainings to nearly 2.5 million participants in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement to prepare the sport community to not only recognize, prevent, and respond to abuse and misconduct. The center has also established policies to prevent abuse and create safe spaces for athletes across the movement. We audit every single NGB to ensure adherence to these rules, and this year we've expanded them to reach deeper into grassroots sports. There was no blueprint on how to begin this work. There was simply a critical mission and a strong will to show up for America's athletes. And that's what we've done. We continue to hear from athletes who are thankful to have had us in their court. Whether we banned an abusive coach when law enforcement declined to prosecute, collaborated with law enforcement on abusers to, uh, to bring abusers to justice, acted on allegations of abuse disclosed decades later, sanctioned individuals, even leaders in sport, who failed to report abuse, or stepped in to seek accountability to, in countless other situations. We are working every day to keep athletes safe. And we've made great strides, but we are also very clear-eyed about why we are here today. We have heard the voices of participants in our process who said that they were let down. We know change is necessary and are ready to make improvements, particularly as it relates to timeliness of investigations, communication, and trauma sensitivity. Eight months ago, we embarked on a deliberate top to bottom review of our response and resolution process, as well as other aspects of our work, seeking input from athletes and other stakeholders in the movement along the way. We've identified an initial set of changes, which included a departmental restructure and realignment, redefining the use of administrative closures, enforcing policies around consistent communication, assigning staff and resources to improve process navigation, trauma sensitivity training, and data collection, as well as other process refinements. Even with these significant process changes, we acknowledge that we must continue to listen and to evolve. We pledge to continue to seek athlete input and keep Congress and the public informed. This is an inflection point for the center and for the entire U.S. Olympic and Paralympic movement. Changes must be made to ensure America's athletes can thrive from the practice field in our neighborhoods to the podium in Paris in just a few short months. We thank the Commission on the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics for their focus on athlete safety, and we agree that improvements must be made to ensure their protection. We also appreciated the Commission's recognition of the center's essential role in the movement and the progress that we've made in standing up a model that has never existed before. We share the belief that every athlete, regardless of their level of play, deserves to be safe. 
Our cases involving high profile athletes and coaches may grab headlines, but most revolve around grassroots athletes playing for local affiliated organizations. And a quick scroll of our CDD shows the impact that we're making in small towns and big cities throughout this country. The commission aptly pointed out that the fractured youth and grassroots sports landscape leaves athletes vulnerable to abuse, and we agree. That's why the center is requesting legislative change to establish a definition for national governing bodies that's inclusive of local affiliated organization and makes clear that NGBs have oversight over such organizations. We also strongly support requiring youth sports organizations to consider the CDD when making hiring and volunteering decisions. Expediting cases resolutions while ensuring thoroughness, fairness, and trauma sensitivity remains a priority and increased resources are necessary to our efforts. We expect reports to continue to grow exponentially, especially as new sports such as flag football and lacrosse have the potential to add more than a million participants to the movement. With additional resources, the center will move forward with setting maximum ceilings on timeframes for case resolution, as well as add additional investigative staff to meet the growing demand. I thank the committee and my fellow witnesses for the opportunity to shed light on this progress we're making, as well as the ways that we are continuing to show up to change for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now recognize Ms. Deal for her five minute opening statement. Test, test. Okay. Chairman, ranking member, and esteemed members of the subcommittee, I'm Nicole Deal, Chief of Security and Athlete Services for the USOPC. I am grateful for this opportunity to discuss the critical issue of athlete safety, a matter that is of paramount importance to our organization and to which the Center for Safe Sport contributes significantly. In my position, I manage safety and security operations at the USOPC, oversee athlete welfare, and work towards enriching resources for Team USA athletes beyond the field of play. I act as a link between the USOPC and the Center for Safe Sport, and as a guide to NGBs on athlete safety matters. Our guiding principle at the USOPC is the safety and well-being of all Team USA athletes. Our mission goes above the pursuit of gold medals and world records, aiming to ensure all athletes can train, compete, and excel in an environment free of misconduct and abuse. This commitment informs every decision and action we take. The USOPC today is significantly different from who we were in 2017. We have evolved, learning from our past and making comprehensive improvements. The transformation extends beyond compliance and government changes to a shift in culture where athlete safety is the inherent value shaping our policies, procedures, and interactions. We updated our mission statement to emphasize the well-being and competitive excellence of Team USA athletes, underscoring our commitment to their safety. We have reinforced athlete safety policies through training and reporting requirements for all members of our organization and processes for thorough investigation and resolution of complaints. We have adopted stricter policies concerning interactions between minor athletes and adults, implemented new background check protocols, and launched an integrity platform. This platform facilitates easy, confidential, and safe reporting of compliance issues, ensuring all concerns are addressed. We aim to foster an environment where safety is the norm. We provide role-specific safety training for all staff interacting directly with athletes and an effort amplified by our collaboration with experts in this field. We have established robust anti-retaliation policies to protect individuals who report allegations, a vital part of our commitment to transparency and accountability, and a testament to our determination to foster an environment where everyone feels comfortable reporting concerns without fear of reprisal. We believe in the Center for Safe Sports' unique mission and capabilities to promote athlete safety, supporting it with an annual contribution of $17.4 million and affirming its independence annually via a GAO certification process. We recognize the importance of continuous improvement. Our athlete safety listening survey since 2020 shows a 113% increase in athletes reporting that they know how to report allegations of sexual misconduct. A testament to our efforts to cultivate an environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and comfortable reporting concerns. 
In the realm of NGB compliance, the USOPC holds a unique role. While we are responsible for the oversight of the NGBs regarding safe sport compliance, we also serve as a national governing body for 10 sports and are held to those exact same standards. The dual role provides us with a profound insight into the diverse needs and specific challenges each NGB faces as it relates to athlete safety. Recognizing the unique challenges each NGB faces, we share a common goal, to transform the US Olympic and Paralympic athlete safety system into a paragon of trust and excellence in abuse prevention and response within sport. This requires the center to undertake key reforms in its current operations. These include enhancing the athlete experience so that the center becomes a trusted partner for athletes, refining the response and resolution process for greater transparency and communication to boost its effectiveness, and showcasing an eagerness to learn and adapt through the receptiveness and feedback in implementing change. In partnership with the NGBs, we are dedicated to crafting solutions that hold perpetrators accountable and position us as trusted support for athletes. In conclusion, our commitment to athlete safety and wellness is steadfast. It is the cornerstone of our organization. We pledge to all Team USA athletes, past, present, and future, that we are unwavering in our mission to ensure their safety and wellness. We appreciate your partnership in making this a reality, and I stand ready to answer any questions you may have, and thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Thank you, and I now recognize Ms. Shim for her five-minute opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Griffith, Ranking Member Castor, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the U.S. Soccer Federation's view on the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. My name is Mana Shim, and I'm the chair of U.S. Soccer's Participant Safety Task Force. I played professional soccer for seven years in the National Women's Soccer League, most recently coming out of retirement to play for New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC. <clears throat> In 2015, when I was playing for the Portland Thorns, I was repeatedly sexually harassed by my coach. He sent me explicit text messages and ordered me to come alone to his hotel room, where I found him waiting undressed. Like so many other athletes who have endured abuse, at first I felt like there was nothing I could do to stop it because of power imbalance that exists between player and coach. He determined whether I started and how much I played, which meant he controlled the entire trajectory of my career. When I finally reported what happened to my team and to the NWSL, I thought they would protect me and my teammates. Instead, the person that they went out of their way to protect was my coach. I retired from professional soccer in 2018 and went home to Hawaii to attend law school. While I was there, I received a call from a former teammate, Sinead Farley, who told me that she had been sexually harassed by the same coach and that there were other players who had been victimized too. We were afraid for the athletes he was still coaching. So we decided to speak up publicly, and when our story was published in The Athletic, it spurred a reckoning in women's professional soccer. In the wake of the story, U.S. Soccer hired former Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates to conduct an independent investigation. Her report found widespread and systemic abuse across the league that went far beyond just my coach. To many people, the, the findings were shocking. To me, they were heartbreaking, but I wasn't surprised. The report confirmed what I already knew that abuse in our sport is rooted in youth soccer. As professional players, we had all been conditioned since we were kids to believe that the mistreatment we were experiencing was normal and that if we spoke up about it, no one would care. The report made clear that our younger players are at risk just as I once was and that if we don't address this problem now, it will only get worse. The Yates report also noted something else very important. The US Center for Safe Sport is not doing its job effectively. Ms. Yates found evidence to suggest that Safe Sport is failing the very athletes it was designed to protect, including younger players. I have seen that for myself. More than two years after my story was published, Safe Sport's investigation of my coach remains open. When I became chair of the task force in 2022, I decided to devote much of my time to advocating for legislation to make important changes to Safe Sport. I want to ensure that all allegations of abuse are taken seriously and that bad actors are held accountable and prevented from harming other athletes. I feel strongly that any legislation taken up by Congress must address specific issues that we at U.S. Soccer, along with many other NGBs who are working on the, this legislation with us, have encountered with the safe sport process. First, we need increased transparency. 
SafeSport does not share enough information with NGBs and it is standing in the way of protecting athletes. Second, we need to limit the number of SafeSport investigations that end in administrative closure. Administrative closure leaves both parties in limbo indefinitely, and at its worst, it, allow, it can allow sexual predators to fall through the cracks and remain in sport. Third, we need to ensure that US soccer and other NGBs can take action when safe sport does not. When safe sport administratively closes a matter, it maintains exclusive jurisdiction, preventing NGBs from taking any action except for a safety plan that cannot include keeping someone out of the sport. We believe that when a case is administratively closed, NGBs should be allowed to implement further measures to protect athletes if they are necessary. Finally, we need to ensure the appeals process works for claimants and respondents alike. SafeSport's current process forces victims of abuse who are brave enough to participate in an initial investigation to go through the process all over again in an appeal. At times, if the victim is unwilling to go through a second proceeding, SafeSport has vacated its findings or had its decisions overturned by arbitrators. The result is that SafeSport has lifted sanctions against abusers even after they have been found by substantial evidence to have committed sexual misconduct. U.S. Soccer believes SafeSport is an essential and valued partner in a shared mission. But all too often, we have seen the center fall short and fail athletes who courageously come forward to share their stories of abuse. We need Congress to pass legislation that will reform the safe sport process, eliminate barriers to protecting athletes, and ensure this important organization is, a, is able to provide safe, healthy environments in sport. U.S. Soccer stands ready to work alongside you to accomplish this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now recognize Mr. Kress for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Griffith, Ranking Member Castor, and the members of the subcommittee. USA Softball greatly appreciates the Congressional Committee for listening and working with all parties to further advance the fundamental purpose of the Amateur Sports Act and the U.S. Center for Safe Sport to better protect athletes from potential harm. Summary of major points, Safe Sport is a valuable tool for athlete safety. USA Softball has been a standard bearer for background checks and coach umpire education predating Safe Sport. All minor age requirements Participants deserve protection, yet hundreds of thousands are currently unprotected. Other non-NGB youth sports organizations actively target national governing bodies by promoting that they are exempt from safe sport requirements. Help protect all athletes by creating a level playing field where all youth athletes are affordable, the protection that they deserve, and NGBs are not at a competitive disadvantage with grassroots sports. The U.S. Center for Safe Sport was created for the need, purpose of developing policies and procedures to better protect athletes and better protect, provide a safe environment for participants. Please know that long before the U.S. Center for Safe Sport and any national scandals or state law mandates, our organization, USA Softball, an early adopter of criminal background checks and educational programs for coaching of our youth athletes. USA Softball has also maintained a decades-old disciplinary process to remove wrongdoers from participation in our activities. It is in part because of this tradition within our organization that we believe the U.S. Center for Safe Sport has an extremely important purpose in taking on a monumental task. Upon the creation of the Safe Sport Center, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee and the national governing bodies of sports were asked to assist in providing funding to the center. The NGBs completely understood and support that all adults participating in youth sport as an administrator, coach, or official should be regularly educated as well as provide an up-to-date yearly background check. The responsibility for these adults following these requirements falls to the NGBs and is audited by the U.S. Center for Safe Sport for compliance. USA Softball has been working within this framework and under the U.S. Center for Safe Sport for the past several years. However, there seems to be an assumption that by regulating the NGBs, all youth sports participants are covered and protected. However, that is an incorrect assumption. In just our sport of softball, there are at least 25 other organizations that are conducting softball events that are not obligated to meet safe sport requirements or adhere, or adhere to safe sport policies, which includes our minor athlete abuse prevention policies. That means that there are hundreds of thousands of youths participating in play where the adults are not safe sport educated and potentially not had any background check screening in just the sport of softball alone. 
Those athletes are as equally important and equally deserving of protection as the athletes participating in the USA softball programs, yet they are not receiving the benefit of those policies and procedures. It is a present day reality that other national and regional sports organizations that are not NGBs are not required to follow the U.S. Center for Safe Sport educational and other requirements. This is not only without justification for the benefit of the participants, but has also created an issue for the NGBs. In recent years, we have seen individuals move their programs and tournaments away from our NGBs so they, in such vitally important policies and procedures, no longer apply to their programs. This is not a good development for the participants. These other organizations, both national and regional, are not held to the same standards for participation and not affording their athletes the benefit of policies and procedures of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. By way of example, USA Softball has, in, has had individuals leave our organization recently and have formed their own softball associations while publicly advertising on their websites that safe sport is not required for teams, coaches, or umpires to participate in their new organizations. USA Softball, like many other NGBs, feel that all youth participants should have the same type of protection when participating across all youth sports organizations, and USA Softball believes that this loophole should be closed so the athletes are provided the benefit of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport and its policies. USA Softball and other NGBs are asking for the playing field to be leveled and all organizations that are offering opportunities to youth in any sports be required to have their administrators, coaches, and officials become safe sport educated and audited for these practices, just like the NGBs that are offering other grassroots programming. Thank you. Th thank you for your, your testimony. We will now move into the question and answer portion of the hearing, and I will begin uh, the questioning and recognize myself for five minutes. Let me say in the, in the startup that we've got at least two issues. Uh, one, we've got to make it safer. Apparently, we've got some gaps. Ms. Shim has pointed that out, uh, Ms. Colon, and we'll have to work on that. Two, we have the situations that Mr. Cress has brought up where people are intentionally getting out from under the umbrella of safe sport. And that was actually brought to me, and it's one of the good news, bad news things. Uh, it was brought to me by a coach. It was not brought by some high-powered lobbyist. One of my coaches in my district came to me and said, we have a problem. Um, this hearing today probably, again, good news, bad news. It probably won't make the front page of any major news uh, outlet. The reason for that is, is that I think most of the members, while we may not completely agree on how to solve the problems, most of the members of this committee, particularly this subcommittee, are passionate about trying to help where we can to change the legislation, to make the changes that we think are necessary to solve some of the problems you've raised, uh, Ms. Shim, and some of the problems that you recognize as, as well, uh, Ms. Colon. That being said, uh, I have to tell you, I did smile uh, back in February. I went to a Virginia High School League swimming meet. I've been involved in uh, the sport of swimming for 55 years, and my son was the alternate. We've never been great. We've been good, but we've never been great. He was the alternate on a relay team that was competing at the state championship. And as I found myself compelled to head to the men's room, I couldn't help but smile because on the door there was a sign that I've never seen before at any swimming meet, and I've been going for 55, 57 years to swimming meets, that said, no swimmers allowed in this bathroom, safe sport. I got to tell you, I smiled because this committee has been working on that kind of stuff, and it's a small step. It doesn't solve Ms. Shim's problems. It's nowhere near those problems. But I couldn't help but think somebody's paying attention, and we're, we're doing some good stuff. All right, that said, Mr. Cress. How many, how many youth leagues are currently affiliated with USA Softball? Um, youth leagues across the United States is um, into the hundreds of thousands that are affiliated with us. And do you have a number of how many teams are out there that are still operating that have disaffiliated from your organization in the past year? In the past year, disaffiliated has been approximately um, 3,500. <laughs> And it was more the year before that, and I mean, it's, so that's yes. cumulative. There's more than that. And uh, how many how many leagues have disaffiliated? When you take that many teams, the leagues are a little bit less than that, so it's only about uh, 300. Okay. 
And how many athletes would you say that encompasses? Um, at 3,000 teams or 3,500 teams, uh, we're looking at about uh, 6,000 athletes. Yeah. And what concerns me is, is that you're the national governing body. Your member leagues are required to report abuses and to follow the safe sport uh, standards. And, and while they may not be perfect, they may not be as good as we'd like them to be, it's a whole lot better than having no standards. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir, I would agree. And your coaches and trainers are undergoing the safe sport training, and they have to do uh, – I mean, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not that much, a two-hour training course – the first year in 30 to 45 minutes each uh, or subsequently every three years. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And, and yet, because of the fees that are, in, that are uh, required because of the background checks and because of the, having to sit down and watch a, a video and, and maybe answer some questions, you're, you're losing these teams to other leagues that are specifically advertising. I think you testified that – you don't have to deal with the background check and you don't have to deal with uh, um, taking the classes. If you come over here, it's just a lot easier. That is correct. That is what we're seeing. And the problem that I have with that is, as a former criminal defense attorney is, is that if you make it easy for the bad guys, they're going to go where it's easier. Isn't that true? That is uh, what we have found out. Yes, sir. Yeah. So if you, if you uh, have intentions to do bad things in any sport, not just softball, you're going to try to go where the safe sport is not at least doing some protective work. Isn't that true? That's correct. And, and that's what concerns me, and we've got to figure it out. We thought that by going to the national governing bodies we would take care of it. That was our error, and that's one of the things we have to fix. Would you agree with that? I would. Yes, sir, I do agree. Ms. Shim, you would agree with that too, wouldn't you? Yes, I would agree. Ms. Deal, do you agree with that? Completely. And you, I assume, would agree with that too, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's something that we just have to work on uh, to a great degree. I've got a couple of documents that just uh, point out the advertisements so that anybody out there who thinks and, or reads the record later thinks there wasn't any evidence of that. Okay. We've got the advertisements, and we're going to submit those of leagues saying, Come to us. You don't have to do a safe sport, and I'll submit those, and we'll put that up later. All right. That being said, I yield my time back and now recognize Ms. Castor for her five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again to our witnesses. We, you know, when Congress created safe sport, we intended it <clears throat> to be the go-to resource for athletes to report sexual, emotional, physical abuse, uh, and we intended our athletes when they do that, to be heard and respected. Uh, Ms. Shem, I think you are a hero. I think you are courageous for telling your story about sexual abuse uh, by your coach. There are, I've, I've expressed to you, you are speaking out on behalf of so many athletes that just have not had uh, the wherewithal, uh, the ability to come forward and do it. So thank you for that. You uh, reported to Safe Sport. Uh, the abuse. Tell us how we've read the Yates report, but tell tell us about your experience and what would you highlight right off the bat as the most critical reforms for the Congress? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, first, I didn't report the the abuse because I didn't know about Safe Sport at the time. Um, U.S. Soccer reported the abuse, which I was really grateful for. Um, I was out of out of soccer at the time. Um, and I would say, you know, I was investigated or interviewed by a number of different investigators and attorneys. And I would say the thing that stands out the most is the lack of communication to athletes um, and all parties involved, really. US soccer, the NGB similarly, don't get information. Um, but I, I just felt like the process itself was unprofessional. Um, I remember seeing an email with my coach's name spelled wrong, um, and it's a small detail, but it it just feels like maybe it's not taken as seriously, um, and just the fact that it's taken so long, the fact that it remains open, um, and I'm here not because of my specific case. I feel like it was high profile enough that even if you know, the case um, resulted in administrative closure, 
I don't think that coach will be hired um, in the United States. Yes, does that answer the question? Yeah, and the – so is that a similar uh, issue that you've heard from others that have reported to Safe Sport? Yes, unfortunately – um, a number of my friends who play soccer, and also I've spoken to a number of other athletes in other sports who have had um, unpleasant experiences with the Center for Safe Sport and their investigators. Is, and is that going to be an incentive for athletes and their families to report? Do you think that's, that's a problem, that that's going to discourage them from, from reporting and being involved? Here, I think I'll tell you that it discourages a lot of people, but it is my job to, um, as a mandated reporter, to tell people they must report, and I encourage reports, and I'm hopeful that the Center for Safe Sport will improve its processes um, so more people do feel confident in their process and that they will find justice and some resolution in their case. So, Ms. Cologne, you've you have embarked on some reforms there at Safe Sport. Thank you for that. One of the overriding concerns I'm hearing, we're hearing from directly is athletes do not feel heard, that that is going to be a disincentive for folks to report, and then the high rate of administrative closures. Could you address those two? What are you doing to correct that? Sure. Still on? Okay. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think first off, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, the experience that Ms. Shim has gone through, with, particularly with um, reporting to the center as well as her, her friends and teammates, right? That is not the experience that we want uh, for any athlete um, at any level to experience. And, you know, we're continuing to work diligently to process through a number of cases so that we, and, ish, and changes so that we don't run into that again. Um, when we think about the use of administrative closures, I think it's also important to understand why we use them in the first place. Um, and administrative closure for us is, is a way for us to maintain um, the ability to reopen a case. And so one of the things that we have heard loud and clear is, you know, that the Center for Safe Sport needs to be more trauma-informed and more trauma-sensitive. One of the ways in which we do that is we give athletes, we give victims, we give survivors the ability and time it takes for them to come forward with their stories. We recognize that when someone comes to us after being um, sexually harassed, assaulted, abused, that that takes a lot of courage. Um, and they may not be ready to do that just yet. And so we want to give them the time that it takes to do that. And if they want to pause that process, if they want to stop it all together, we want to give them that ability to do that as well. And so we hold on to cases in many instances of administrative closure so it ensures that we're able to continue to do that. Now we do recognize also that with administrative closures, we uh, need to really exercise that closure process more judiciously, and we're certainly working on that throughout our ch many changes that we're making at the, for the entire investigative process. Thank you. We'll continue to dig in. Gentlelady yields back now. Recognize Ms. Rogers, Chairwoman of the full committee. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Colon. You, so you publicly have acknowledged that you're always or you're constantly looking for ways to improve the center. And I'm sure you're aware that the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics highlighted specific areas that you should improve. One that's already been raised today is just this whole issue of athletes not knowing what happens with their case uh, after they report to you. So uh, I'd like to hear what steps are you taking to improve communications with the athletes who have filed a claim? Thanks for that question, uh, Chairwoman. Um, for communication, like, that's one of the biggest, the biggest priorities for the, for the center, right? Because you want to make sure that anybody who goes through our process understands, one, what, they are, what the expectations are once they call us, um, but also where their case sits in the process, whether it's the very beginning or towards the very end. So one of the things that we've already done is done some restructuring and realignment within the organization to make sure that teams are working more closely together so that information is better shared. Um, that, was, that was something that we 
recognized was not happening, and so that's already started to happen. Additionally, we are investing in hiring more resource navigators to help athletes who go through our process to understand what that is, and that is someone that they can count on and call to say, hey, what, what do I expect next? What should happen in the next few days or weeks or months? Okay. That's a big piece, and then also, of course, you know, adding to available content on our website, communications channels, Okay, um, and okay like. thank you. I have some more questions. Sure. So Scott Gray, who's affiliated with U.S. Hockey, testified to the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics that based on his experience conducting about 1,500 safe sport investi investigations that they should take two weeks, so one month at the latest. So why are some of your center's investigations taking longer than a year? Well, I would say that our cases are much more complex than Mr. Gray's. Um, okay. We deal with sexual abuse allegations while he deals with emotional and physical abuse. Okay. Thank, uh, how many unresolved current investigations do you have right now that have been ongoing for more than six months? Uh, I would have to check the data for you and get back to you. Okay. Like that and also those that have been going on, ongoing for more than a year. Absolutely. Uh, because some of your investigations go on for a year, even two, before they're resolved, is the center concerned that the athletes filing reports may become discouraged and quit the process? Yes, yes. Okay. Is the center concerned that cases that go on for so long without a resolution may allow offenders to continue abusing their athletes? In those cases, no. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because when we receive a case um, and there is a, a threat or ha of, of harm, we are also able to implement temporary measures to remove people from sport during the investigation. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Shem, thank you for being here and, and speaking out, leading, taking some of the pain and suffering that you have endured and, and helping others, making sure that people are held accountable, but also taking action to pour into our young generation and help them. You represent U.S. soccer and are responsible for player safety there. Can you characterize your views on U.S. soccer's dealings or experiences working with the center? Thank you for the question. I will say that they have started to improve, which is um, really hopeful. Initially, we went to the Center for Safe Sport and tried to be collaborative. And I think, you know, this was, the Center for Safe Sport was premised on the fact that NGBs were not um, doing the right thing for player safety. And I think that has changed. Um, and our relationship with the center is improving, but I don't think it's ideal right now. So keeping in mind that the center was intentionally created to be an independent entity looking into abuses occurring at NGBs and associated leagues, isn't it their discretion on how much they share with NGB justified? It is their discretion, mm -hmm. and I will say that I think it would be a lot easier for us as NGBs to take our jobs seriously and, um, and adhere to the, the Ted Stevens Act, and part of our job is to protect athletes, and we can't do that with very limited information, um, a one or two line sentence about what an allegation is mm -hmm. without more detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Kress, you've been CEO of USA Softball for 10 years. I uh, just wanted, in the time remaining, just to give you some, of, some time for your perspective on this. You know it started six years ago. What areas would you recommend for improving, and why are you soccer, softball leagues unaffiliate, unaffiliating themselves from U.S. softball? Is it, is it safe sport related? Thank you for the question. It's not all uh, safe sport related. Obviously, there are a lot of different entities out there that are um, trying to make money and they're offering events and having uh, softball leagues so that they start up. As I said earlier, there are over 25 other organizations out there that, I, that are known that are running events, and I think that some of them go that way from a standpoint. And, and also, I look at things, a lot of times, it's people pick the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And it, it, if you can sign up for an event and, and do it online and, and do it quickly and, and not have to meet other criteria, then I think that's the path that, uh, unfortunately, that some teams are and their parents and coaches are selecting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Gentlelady yields back. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Perlone, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. Let me start with uh, Ms. Uh, Shin. As someone who was in a terrible position of having to report an allegation of abuse to Safe Sport, um, I know you've said something about your experiences, but I wanted to ask you about the transparency of the investigation process and the communication you received from 
from Safe Sport. And if you have uh, any recommendations for improvements in Safe Sport's process to make them more transparent and to increase the communications between uh, Safe Sport and athletes, if you would. Over the over more than two years, I would say we've gotten about four status updates on my case. I think that's too infrequent. I think more frequent updates would be helpful. Um, and some of the updates, the last update I got was that there would be a new investigator on the case um, and that they were planning on wrapping it up. I believe that was two months ago. Um, so more information, more frequent status updates. All right. You know, I think improvements have to be made so that athletes trust safe sport and athletes who are have who are brave enough to come forward and make a report should clearly know the process for their case and be kept regularly informed about its status. So that's why I appreciate what you just said. Uh, let me go to Miss um, Colon. I understand that uh, Safe Sport is undertaking a thorough review of its response and resolution internal processes you mentioned. Have key stakeholders been consulting during the review? And is the center planning to institute reforms that increase transparency and communication into, in response to the concerns raised by athletes or NGBs and, and now the commission? Yes, we have. We've included uh, NGBs, we've included uh, survivor groups, we've included athletes uh, to be, get a better understanding of what the concerns are and how to best address them. We've also convened a number of working groups internally to focus on um, about 10 different areas uh, of improvement and have been working steadily towards those. And then what will you make the results of your review and any proposed uh, reforms public at some point? Absolutely. All right. Well, I, you know, I just wanted to say uh, those are my questions, but, you know, we all support safe sport. We appreciate the important work it's being tasked with, uh, but we have to work together to strengthen safe sport to better protect the health and well-being of, of athletes. And, you know, I guess, um, you know, look, I obviously believe that uh, safe sport plays an essential role in ensuring the safety, and it has taken on an enormous task. Um, but there is a growing need for transparency and accountability, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, this report um, that was released earlier this month by the Commission on the State of U.S. Olympics and Paralympics, you know, made, um, you know, basically three points that I think relate to what I've been asking. And first, that athletes who have made reports to Safe Sport do not always know what is happening with their cases. Second, that communication protocols between safe sport and complainants are not sufficient. And third, that some cases take years to be resolved and others are never resolved, leaving the complainants waiting indefinitely for information and resolution. So that's why I think the issue of transparency and communication is so important and why I ask those questions. But thank you all. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Now recognize uh, Dr. Burgess for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before Mr. Pallone leaves, I want to shock him by saying I want to associate myself with your remarks about safe sport. I mean, I was here when, when the committee worked to, uh, to create that, and it was necessary and it was important. But it's also necessary and important that we continue to work with you and to keep continually apprised of what's working and what's not and what you might need to, to make your job uh, more effective. I was going to ask you about ways you could discuss where the Safe Sports Center could be more committed and more effective. You already mentioned navigators, but as you were doing that and taking and bearing in mind Ms. Shim's testimony, maybe not just a navigator, but an advocate, someone who will push a little bit when, when it's necessary to push? So every, every claimant respondent that goes to our process has the ability right now to have um, uh, an advisor along the way. The Center for State Sport doesn't provide advocates at the moment, um, but I could certainly uh, see where that would be useful and we'd be open to having that conversation to see how we could implement that. Well, I hope that's something that we can look at. It. Are there any other ways that you have that you'd like to share with us that you'd like the, that would be available to you to improve sure. what we're doing? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that we're doing internally. 
um, that I think will certainly help not only communication aspect, but the timeliness, um, and then just better information sharing, right? And so one we've talked about around administrative closures, um, certainly uh, taking a look at what additional resources we can pro provide to NGB so that they can help navigate some of their own um, cases regarding emotional and physical abuse misconduct I think are going to be helpful. Uh, how we process and, and work with minor claimants and minor respondents to the process is also going to be important um, so that we can start to get to some of those lower level um, sexual abuse allegations or harassment faster. Um, and I think all of those collectively will start to show vast improvement with the organization. In addition to, of course, you know, adding additional staff, uh, the numbers are steadily increasing and we anticipate that those numbers will continue to go up. And so I think we will continue to have the question around timeliness just because of sheer volume in the future. Let me ask you a question, and it may be a little bit, a little bit off-center, but I practiced medicine for a number of years in a former life. If I encountered a situation where I felt that a child was a victim of child abuse, I had no option. I had to report that under state law or I was in trouble. Uh, it wasn't a question of protecting someone else. It was a question of protecting myself. I've got to report. Do we have that system of mandatory reporting within no. this world? Yes, yes. So every participant, adult participant within the movement is a mandatory reporter. Every uh, employee uh, at an NGB, at a, uh, the U.S. Center for State Sport are mandatory reporters. And at the center, we work really closely with law enforcement, particularly on cases that involve youth. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Deal, let me just ask you, because the issue of administrative closures has come up, um, is this a problem that so many of the cases are being resolved through an administrative closure? Um, yes. Um, in my experience in working with the NGBs, it's a big issue. Um, and it's not so much the process of administrative closures, it's the lack of information when cases are closed and that individual comes back to that sporting community without the information to properly put safety measures in place. Well, so, again, that was the concern when, with Ms. Shim's testimony that you reach a dead end and then someone on the other side of that transaction is continuing to be harmed because we've gotten come to no resolution. Um, and could you just speak a little bit about trauma-informed practices in, in safe sport? Is that something that you're pursuing as well? From the USOPC perspective, yes. We have engaged with outside um, subject matter experts to provide enhanced training above and beyond what's mandated by the Center for Safe Sport. So um, all U USOPC employees, as well as athletes that we manage, one, understand the signs, recognize the signs of grooming behavior. Yes. Understand if someone comes to them asking for assistance, how to respond and be a supportive person, and how to report and how to follow up, critically important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back in the interest of time. The gentleman yields back. Now recognize Ms. DeGitt, who's been very Thank interested in this for a long time. Ms. Thank DeGitt, you. your five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Colon, um, well, first of all, let me say, Ms. Shim, thank you for coming to testify today. I want to add my thanks to all my colleagues. And I want to thank you for, for doing the right thing at soccer and trying to improve the situation for the NGBs. The reason why Safe Sport was, was formed, and you, everybody on this panel today knows that it was really clear that all the NGBs were not doing their job, which is why we had the Michigan State, the USA Olympics, Ohio State's wrestling program, all these programs where the NGBs were not doing their job. And that's why we have safe, safe sport. But I've been working with Congresswoman Ross and others to try to develop legislation to effectuate some of the things that you're talking about here today. And I'm really hoping, Mr. Chairman, that we can do this and we can work with you and the ranking member um, on this legislation. So I just have some quick questions to ask to get some evidence for the record. Um, the first thing is, Ms. Cologne, um, I, I think you said in your testimony, when Safe Sport was first founded, it had roughly 300 reports. Is that right? That's correct. And now, um, last year, you got 7,500 reports just last year. Awesome. Is that right? It's It's been almost overwhelming since Safe Sport was founded, the number of reports, and that's alarming, but it's also good that people are reporting. Is that right? Yes. Now, 
To fund the organization, Congress required the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee to contribute $20 million to Safe Sport every year. Is that right? Yes. Congress also contributes money. This year, we contributed $2.5 million, even though we asked for $5 million in authorization. Isn't that right? Yes. How much do you think it would cost to actually adequately fund Safe Sport? Based on the trajectory of cases, I would say that our budget needs to be around $30 million. And, and um, Ms. Deal, you would probably agree with that on behalf of the um, report, the commission report. Is that right? Agree that we fund the center. No, no. Agree, agree that, that Safe Sport needs a lot more funding than they're getting right now. Yes. Yeah. And so, so one of the reasons why we have these long delays right now is because you simply don't have enough investigators to, to investigate it as fast as you want to. Yes, that's correct. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, um, we, we try to triage as best possible. Uh, I think working on efficiencies internally is also something that we have to do as an organization. Um, the realignment is helping. Um, and so, you know, all of those internal things we can, we can do to help speed up. Um, but if we are to get 25%, 50%, 100% more cases over the next, let's say, three to five years, we will continue to have this conversation. Now, one of the suggestions that U.S. soccer and others made, um, and it was discussed a little bit this morning, if, um, if there is an administrative closure that the um, NGBs get the case back, uh, what is the, your opinion on that, to turn the investigative authority back to the NGBs? I, I'm against that. And tell me why. So one, um, you know, again, one of the reasons that we keep cases uh, when we administratively close them is the ability to reopen them. What we would not want to happen is if we were to hold that case, then an NGB start to investigate again. We've had instances where athletes have called us and say, hey, wait a minute, say sport, you told me you were going to give this a hold and then I got a call from my NGB. We don't want that to happen. We do recognize, however, that NGBs do need additional information in order to make better decisions, whether that is around safety planning, membership decisions, or employment decisions. And, and um, it wasn't one of the problems before we had Safe Sport that, that, um, NG, that, that the depth and ability of the NGBs to do independent investigations varied quite widely very much so. Ms. Deal, you're shaking your head, too, on that. Completely agree. Within the 50-plus organizations, the resources and the capacities vary tremendously. Yeah, so some, some, some organizations, they would robustly investigate quickly and deal with it, and others didn't have the resources to do anything, and they would just let these people stay in place. Isn't that right? Anyone? Sure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's just, it, it varies. Just, I mean, Craig mentioned it earlier, like the budget size are very different, the staff sizes are very different, and their abilities vary greatly. Right. And Ms. Shim, have you seen this with your, as well, with the other organizations you've worked with? Yes, we acknowledge that NGBs vary in size and resources. Okay. Thank you. I'm out of time, but I appreciate all of the effort, all of you are putting on making this, this movement the very, very best it can be, and we look forward to working with you. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, and I recognize uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie. For his Thank you very much. I'm sorry I missed your opening testimony. I was chairing another subcommittee uh, at the same time, so I apologize. This is extremely important. And uh, as our athletes are getting ready for Paris and representing our great country over there, where I know that there are a lot are getting prepared that don't even go to the Olympics. And so, but it is an exciting time, and we want people, to, athletes, to, to thrive and, and feel safe. At the same time, and so, um, Ms. Colon, is there a way that you can have? What, where do you think we can improve the partnership between Safe Space and our national governing bodies? What are some areas you think just needs improvement? It's I, clear. I, thanks for the question. I, I think one is is around the communication. We've talked about that uh, quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. How can we provide additional just information and comms to not only NGB but for athletes throughout the process? Uh, I think also being able to help them understand some of the changes that we're making and then being inclusive of their, their thoughts and their opinions and suggestions and recommendations on how we make those process changes I think is also important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've undergone a, com uh, a pretty robust review of that where we've certainly taken into account NGB these um, uh, opinions and, and, per, and perspectives. So, so once an athlete makes a, a, a concern, voices a concern, 
and we want to immediately protect that athlete, obviously. How do you balance that with the accused saying, wait a minute, let me, I have my side of the story as well. I mean, how do you, how do we immediately secure and make sure the athlete is safe, but also give the opportunity for the accused to, to state their case? Yeah, so we, I mean, we do a, a pretty thorough assessment at the front end to determine whether there's risk. Uh, and if there is a great risk that we have through, um, through witness testimony or through uh, evidence that's presented, um, we will make an assessment and then put in temporary measures while we investigate a case so that we can ensure the safety uh, of athletes throughout the process. Um, and so we have to balance that, of course, um, but that's one of the ways that we do that. In most things, there's the clear, clear and evident or clear and present. You know exactly that person needs to go, and 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 then there's all. It's usually the gray gray areas that are that cause the biggest issues, and so we just need to be careful. So, Ms. Shim, I appreciate you being here as well, and echo uh, what my colleagues have said. What do you uh, believe needs to be done to ensure safe sport is operating more transparently with the American public? And then I'll follow up. What do you think? Uh, what do you believe the organization can learn by working more closely with with your organization? So I do think information sharing, um, like Ms. Cologne said, we, we need more than one or two lines when we're, even when they're, after they've made a risk assessment, we need to know what that risk assessment looks like so we can feel confident in whatever temporary measures or lack thereof um, they've put in place. Um, I also respectfully disagree with Ms. Cologne based on my personal experience that um, victims and, and survivors and athletes have uh, resources. A lot of athletes I've talked to, and, and me personally, um, I didn't understand that I had the ability to, to bring someone along with me, to accompany me, um, to advocate for me if I needed it, and to support me. In fact, I was told not to share my story um, with others because it could interfere with the investigation. And um, I'm a very strong advocate for myself, but not everyone feels that way. Um, and that can discourage people and make them feel like their voice is not heard. Thank you for that. And, and Mr. Kress, in your experience, is there room to protect athletes even further by giving you the chance to partner more closely with safe sport? <laughs> Um, thank you for the question, sir. And, and yes, uh, I think the, the, the theme I've heard today from Ms. Cologne is information and communication. And I think if we're able to partner more and, and learn uh, the things that, that they see as important and they understand the things that are important to us as NGBs, I think there are, is a great way, uh, way for improvement in that way. It, it seems like that uh, uh, we do get uh, things that come out on the reforms and things like that. Uh, but we're not all of understanding. And having information is, is knowledge and that is important when you're trying to work with people. So how, how does your organization ensure that the athlete is protected and safe once an accusation is made, but also give the accused the opportunity to, I mean, the first and foremost, we have to protect athletes, but accused also have the right to, to respond. And so how does your organization deal with that? When we're when a report first comes in and, and then it's before and it's going to safe sport, we will look and we will take temporary measures as well to to do our best to limit the uh, communication path that this uh, accuser has with the with the accused from that standpoint, and put those temporary measures in in place until safe sport makes a determination whether they're going to take uh, um, authorization over it or if it's going to stay with us. Then if it stays with us, then we will further investigate the matter. I think um, my time has expired, and I'll yield back. Thanks for your response. I appreciate it. Gentleman yields back, and now recognize Ms. Schakowsky for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our, our, our panel. Uh, we had a terrible situation in the, uh, in the state of Illinois. Um, and um, I'm sure this is not untypical, I hope it is less typical, um, that um, there was a, uh, someone from uh, the soccer, uh, a soccer coach, who um, abused uh, the athletes, and um, for five years, actually, they found him, and um, he wasn't um, able to, to, to work in that regard. And then it turned out that 
for 22 years he was doing this before he was uh, finally banned for life. Um, and that kind of a delay, I hope we don't see that kind of thing bef uh, again and that we aren't seeing it now. But we have experienced this kind of thing through, through the, uh, the years. So, of course, that's the idea of safe sport, to prevent those things um, from, from happening. But I want to talk to you about how we do fund or how it is funded. My understanding is that the um, um, uh, NGBs that want to file a complaint also have to pay a fee in order for that to um, be uh, researched. Is that true? Can I ask you? So the Center for State Sport um, gets the majority of its funding through the Empowering Olympic and Paralympic Amateur Athletes Act of 2020, which required the USOPC to provide the center with $20 million annually. Uh, we don't have any bearing or um, input on how NGBs are paying into that. Um, so we don't assess how we take reports based on fees. Okay, so there is no fee that has to be paid by the NGBs to um, file the kind of complaint that they want? The NGBs pay an annual fee, I believe, through the USOPC, um, but they do not pay us directly. No, absolutely not. So there's no disincentive built in for them to file some, some kind no. of complaint. So what, what I really want to know, and I'd like to go down the line, how about having independent funding, outside funding, altogether to make sure that there is sufficient amount of money. So that would, I think, include the United States Congress, more money coming your way. But I think um, having independent review, and if I could just go down the line and ask you what you think, not just review, but independent funding, funding that doesn't then turn back um, uh, on the um, athlete and ha create any kind of a disincentive and have the amount that's needed. Could we just go down the line? Sure. I mean, independent funding would certainly be helpful. Um, and as you heard today, that there is a trust issue. Um, and I think that the more independent the funds can be, coming from a multitude of, of revenue streams for the Center for State Sport would certainly be helpful. I echo the same sentiment as Ms. Cologne. Um, the more independent um, revenue streams that they have, the better. We don't want anything preventing an athlete from coming forward to reporting abuse. And if the funding streams are independent and make them feel more comfortable using those different funding streams, we should be um, looking into that. Thank you. U.S. Soccer absolutely supports federal funding. We acknowledge that the Center for Safe Sport does not have adequate funding or resources right now. Um, I will also say that we, our, our fee at the end of the year is based on our caseload. Say that again. Our fee that we pay to the USOPC that then pays to the US Center for Safe Sport is based on the NGB's caseload. So while I believe all the NGBs that I've talked to are working hard to um, report cases, it is based on how many cases are investigated by the Center. So you are saying that they have to pay more the more reporting they do? Yes. So that is a disincentive to it could report. Be. I think it could be. It could be. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it necessarily is, but it could be, yes. Um, USA Softball would agree that, that funding of this uh, institution would be greatly helpful. Uh, it would take that, that perception of lack of independence from a standpoint of the money at 20 million coming from uh, the USOPC and the NGBs. Thank you. I, I know I'm out of time. Let, let me just say it's a good thing that there are more people reporting, but it is unfortunate if we don't have the funding. And I think the United States Congress, and there's been studies that say that independent funding would really help, and I would like to see that happen, and I yield back. Generally yields back. Now recognize Chairman of Energy, Mr. Duncan, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to discuss an incredibly serious issue regarding Parker Egbert, a former constituent of mine for over 20 years and an accomplished 2021 Tokyo Paralympic athlete. 
I made a good look video for Parker before he traveled to Tokyo, wishing him luck representing the United States of America. Little did I know what would happen to Parker when he arrived at the Olympic vi Village. Parker's family told me that the honor of representing our great country was completely taken away by the hands of a monster. I want to submit a New York Times article for the record. I think the staff has that. I was told that Parker was the subject of a brutal and frequent rape, physical and emotional abuse, and grooming, allegedly at the hands, according to the New York Times article, of teammate Robert Griswold. According to the article, Parker was roommates with Griswold in Tokyo and later at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center, even though Griswold was placed in the Safe Sport database in September of 2020 for alleged abuses of other athletes. Parker has an intellectual disability, while Griswold has a physical one. Despite this, they were placed as roommates, creating a huge power imbalance and an environment for right, that was ripe for abuse. Griswold was alleged to be his handler and caretaker, even though he had never undergone any training. Parker was physically abused so brutally and extensively that he still needs physical therapy to this day due to the severe trauma of his abuse. Emotionally, Parker continued to need extensive therapy to move on from this trauma, and his therapists attest to the fact that Parker has been 100% honest regarding his alleged abuser. Because of his intellectual disability, he couldn't fabricate this kind of story. Sadly, Parker will never likely go into a swimming pool again and compete. This once vibrant, talented athlete now will not even think about putting on his cap and goggles. My office is made aware, was made aware of these events in late 2022 by Parker Edwards' parents after their efforts with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the Colorado Springs Police Department, and Safe Sport left them without any justice for their son. We immediately began asking Safe Sport for answers, and we've yet to receive any. So, Ms. Colon... Why were the findings of the 2020 allegations not made available to the Egbert family prior to Parker rooming with Robert Griswold? First, I'd just like to say that that is heartbreaking. Um, his case, uh, I, was, I read the pleading, I read his firsthand accounts, and it was terrible. And nobody should have had to go through what he did. Um, we are in the middle of an investigation on the Safe Sport Center for Safe Sports side, and, and I can't really just disclose too much there because we're in the middle of that investigation. But I will say um, that the center was voluntarily dismissed um, by the plaintiff out of his current lawsuit. So why did an athlete with prior allegations of abuse and placement in the Safe Sport database in 2020 get assigned as Parker's roommate or anyone's roommate despite his intellectual disability? The Center for Safe Work doesn't really have anything to do with um, assignments uh, at the training facility or at any other event, so I really won't be able to answer that. Well, he was in the database. But what obligations does Safe Sport have to disclose allegations of sexual abuse or misconduct? We have uh, extreme allegations, and that's why we uh, update regularly the centralized disciplinary database that houses all of our sanctions. So that's where your transparency kicks in? It does. Okay. Um, why was Robert Griswold even allowed to attend the Tokyo Games to represent Team USA at all, much less uh, give, be given supervision of an athlete with an intellectual disability? We were not involved with the um, selection of Mr. Griswold for the team. Did y'all communicate with the Paralympic Associ Olympic Association prior to the Olympics? We do share information, yes. So that would be a question for them. Uh, the Safe Sport investigation began early 2023 once the Colorado Springs Police Department closed the case. Why have almost two years gone by without a word from Safe Sport investigation? Because we're coordinating with the parties in the civil suit to get access to depositions and discovery to avoid the need to re-interview potential trauma survivors. I'll go back to Ms. Deal. Um, why was the, this athlete allowed to even participate, much less room with uh, someone with an intellectual disability after Safe Sport had him on his database? Um, I just want to start by saying um, my heart goes out to the Egbert family, um, especially Parker. Um, none of us will ever fathom or imagine what he's currently going through right now. Um, since it is an ongoing investigation, as a matter of principle, we'll not discuss it. Well, let me ask you this way. Does the Paralympic, uh, um, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, if you've got access to Safe Sport database, why was this athlete allowed to even participate in the games, much less room with someone that had a disability such as this? In general, the Center for Safe Sport database has current 
restriction or band members. If you are um, finished your probation or you're done with your restriction, you are no longer on the CDD. All right, I'm out of time. I've got uh, four or more questions. I'm going to submit for the record and ask you guys we, to respond to those. We have agreed. The chairman and the myself and the ranking member have agreed. If you want to ask a couple more questions, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. From my understanding, Safe Sport has immunity from being sued civilly. What resolution can be made to a victim of abuse, even when Safe Sport clears the alleged athlete of wrongdoing? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. From my understanding, Safe Sport has immunity from being sued civilly. So what resolution can be made to a victim of abuse even when the safe sport clears the alleged victim or alleged athlete of wrongdoing? So there are other legal remedies for anyone going through something like this. And it, it, you can, for Mr. Parker in particular, he is um, currently in an active lawsuit. How many safe sport investigators are there to investigate and how many claims a year? I think you mentioned the claims a year, but how many investigators do you have? So uh, in total, the center has about 125 staff, half of which are dedicated to response and resolution. Of the 65 plus people in that team, there are about 30 plus investigators, but there are multiple tiers to the investigative process that impact an investigation, not just the investigator. Okay. Y'all have answered some of the other questions from uh, other members. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I think I'm, I'm going to take a minute here, and if you need one, Ms. Castro, you, you go. But I, I worked uh, very closely when I was in the Virginia legislature on issues related to sexually violent predators, and they, it's very difficult to have them uh, change their ways. And so if he was already on the list for some kind of sexual, and I don't know the particulars of this case, so I'm not judging. I'm just saying if somebody's on the list for, for – prior sexual acts, it is unlikely they should ever come off that list. And I'll just leave it at that for you all to take into contemplation. Because my time's up. We might give you another minute at the end, but I just wanted to say that before I lost that thought. Mr. Tonko is now recognized for his five minutes. I apologize we slowed you down a little bit. That's okay. I needed a moment to get my catch my breath. So, busy day. Thank you to the chair and the ranker for the opportunity here today. Um, I want to focus on safe sports use of administrative closures. Um, to dispose of cases. These occur when Safe Sport asserts jurisdiction over a case but ultimately closes it without making findings or issuing any sanctions. So um, as I'm told, in these cases, Safe Sport does not publish any public record of the allegation. NGBs, victim reporting, uh, victims of reporting abuse, and other stakeholders have expressed confusion and concern about the high rate of administrative closures, which, according to your data, represent nearly two-thirds of all safe sport resolutions. So, Ms. Colon, um, I'm looking at the case resolution data safe sport released in its 2022 annual report, and uh, would like to ask you about the numbers. It appears that safe sport accepted jurisdiction for over 7,400 cases, but then administratively closed 4,800 of them. Is that accurate? I'd have to double check the annual report. That sounds about right, though. Okay. And what circumstances lead to administrative, uh, uh, led to administrative closures, and how do you explain the high percentage of cases resolved that way? So there's a number of reasons why we would opt to use an administrative closure. Uh, one is that we want to be able to reopen the case. Um, and so, um, as I shared earlier, um, one of the, the things that we want to do to make sure that we remain uh, and just be more trauma sensitive to victims that go through our process is giving them the time and space to share their story. Uh, and sometimes they'd like to pause, sometimes they'd like to stop for a little while and come back to that. And so we want to make sure that we, have, we keep the ability to be able to do that. In, in our process of, of review over the last several, uh, last eight months, we've also started to break down more categories within administrative closures so that NGBs and others will better understand why we are using that so that they can make better decisions around employment and volunteering, um, including if someone is admonished, um, if someone is deceased. Um, and so pulling some of those out to just provide more transparency in that space. Thank you. And what information is provided to victims and NGBs when the center administratively closes a case? So there's a number of pieces that are provided throughout the process, starting with a notice of jurisdiction, a notice of allegation, uh, and then a, a closure memo that includes certain information. Um, particularly if a case is to be reopened, we typically do not share a lot of information because it could be an active investigation at any moment. Okay, and Ms. Shim, in a July letter to Congress signed by professional and youth players with the U.S. Soccer Federation, the rate of administrative closures is listed as one of the chief concerns about safe sport operations. 
saying it has, and I quote, serious consequences for athletes. So would you describe those consequences for us and explain what options U.S. soccer or any other NGB has when safe sport issues and administrative closure? Yes, we see administrative closures and um, have to affirmatively allow what we see as bad actors to re-enter our sport. Um, and that's an obvious problem. If we have bad actors who are um, have been accused of very serious misconduct participating in our sport, that's a concern. Um, I do think when I understand the desire to admin close, to have the ability to reinvestigate, we think Safe Sports should have that ability regardless. Um, and just in our experience at U.S. Soccer, we've found that when the Center for Safe Sport does reopen a case, um, it's just administratively closed again. And we believe, especially I think the athletes who are, are survivors of abuse, that there should be more autonomy. The athletes should have the ability to talk to whoever they want to. If they want to go to the NGB, um, they should be able to. And understandably, if you know, we shouldn't have NGBs contacting victims that don't want to talk. So we believe there are ways around that. With their consent, they should be able to talk to the NGB and um, report their experience. So in your experience, how do athletes who have reported abuse to Safe Sport react to their cases being administratively closed? Not well. Um, I think they interpret that as they are either not believed or maybe they're believed, but nobody really cares. Um, and it can be really devastating. And we've seen athletes leave the sport who are very capable and should be you know, continuing with their careers. Um, I, was, I, I feel like I stopped early in my career because of the abuse that I experienced. Um, and it, it's really devastating. It has devastating consequences. Thank you. Well, I acknowledge the complexity of the cases that come before Safe Sport, but we need to ensure that credible complaints are not set aside through this process when some action needs to be taken to protect athletes from future abuse. So I hope we can continue to engage with Safe Sport about when and how it uses administrative closures to close out these cases. And with that, I thank you and yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Now recognize Mr. Palmer for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 2021, uh, Safe Sport conducted a survey of um, 4,000 athletes and they, in more than 50 sports and found that 93% of the respondents who experienced sexual harassment or unwanted contact did not report it. Uh, Ms. Cologne, you called that finding jaw-dropping. But Ms. Shim, you're the one I want to talk to about this because uh, in your testimony, you said that you'd reported what happened to, your, uh, to you, to your team and the National Women's Soccer League and informed U.S. Soccer and thought those organizations would protect you, but instead they went out of their way to protect the coach. Now, that doesn't involve safe sport, but you later pointed out from the Yates report that safe sport is failing the very athletes that it was designed to protect. The situation is so dire that Ms. Yates affirmatively stated that leaders in soccer can't rely exclusively on safe sport to keep players safe and should implement safety measures when necessary to protect players. And you went on uh, in your testimony uh, to talk about the fact that they had administrative close so many cases. And so uh, the abuse of, of, of athletes is, is widely known. And when you have a survey of 4,000 athletes and so many of them admit that they had, that they'd been abused or uh, felt pressured but failed to report it, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just reading your testimony, it, it seemed to me that, that one of the biggest impediments to a, an athlete's willingness to report something is that they don't think anything will be done about it. I'd like for you to comment on that. I think that's absolutely right. It's really difficult to report when you look around and see other athletes reporting and no resolution. Well, it's not limited to the United States. Exactly an hour and 
eight minutes ago, Washington Post reported that over 300 French sports coaches, teachers, and officials have been accused of sexual abuse or cover-up in 2023. There's an article, other articles about what's going on in Canada. And I just think it's, it's amazing to me, given the attention that we've given to this, that we went to the, the to the lengths of, of, of trying to establish a, an entity to deal with this, that this still occurs at, at the rate that it does, and there's so many athletes that that uh, are reluctant to report it. So in, in your view, uh, what do we need to do? Because I, I'm, I'm concerned, I, and I, I hate to say this, uh, Ms. Cologne, that uh, you guys are not not defending the athletes. You're not there proactively to protect the interest of the athletes. And, I'll, and, and you know, Ms. Shim, I'm, I, you showed extraordinary courage and, and because you knew you could lose your position on the team, but you did. You defended yourself, first of all. But it didn't result in the defense of other players because the proper action wasn't taken. So could you comment on that? Yes, I think it's everyone's responsibility, all NGBs, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, USOPC, to implement appropriate prevention and education training. Um, I will give credit to the Center for Safe Sport. I think they do a good job with their prevention um, and education program, and we at U.S. Soccer are um, improving ours, and as well as other NGBs. Um, it's still not enough. Yeah. It's not robust enough. It is, this issue is so prevalent. And to your point, it's happening everywhere. And almost to a degree that, you know, what can we do? Um, but I think we need to all believe that there are still things we can, we can do. And the biggest takeaway for me is that we cannot do this if we're acting independently. We need to come together and, um, you know, collaborate on potential solutions. You know, um we talk about let's spend more money on this, and, and I think we could spend twice as much money or even more. But until you deal with the character issue of the people involved, yes, I think so much of what's going on here is they're not, it's not so much they're trying to get to the bottom of issues, it's they're protecting their own interest, the interest of the sport, the money that's involved. And I, I just think we've got to do a better job of vetting not only the coaches, but vetting the people who oversee the institutions that are supposed to be there for the athletes. Because we've gotten to a point in sport where money uh, controls everything. And I, I mean, we're having this debate about college athletics right now. Money is the primary focus when it should be the athlete. And, Mr. Chairman, that's my biggest concern, is we have institutions that are there to protect the athlete, uh, and the coaches, for that matter, but we don't. And I don't think throwing more money at it is necessarily going to be the solution. I, I think we've got to have more people who have the guts uh, d demonstrated by Ms. Shim to come forward, but also to be in a position to be there to not only speak for the athlete but defend the athlete when these things occur so that you don't have what, what it said, 93% say they've experienced some form of harassment, but then they're, they don't report it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back, now recognize the Vice Chairman of this subcommittee, Ms. Lesko, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and this is definitely an eye-opening and somber um, committee hearing, so thank you for having it, Mr. Chair. My first question is for Ms. Shim. Um, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport has referred back to U.S. soccer more than 600 cases it thought could be better handled at the national governing board body level, most involving emotional and physical abuse and violations of minor athlete abuse prevention policies. Do you know what the outcomes of these cases have been, and can you describe how what the resolution process is with your organization? Yes, we do track those cases, and I don't have the numbers here with me, um, but I can get those and submit them to the record. Uh, our, our organizations are responsible for addressing concerns that we would consider lower level. Um, some of that is athlete-on-athlete -athlete abuse. Uh, I think 
12 year old boys being on the same team, um, mm -hmm. you know, saying bad words to each other, things like that that are reported. Um, and we, it's our responsibility as an NGB to follow up on those reports. So we acknowledge and appreciate the caseload that the Center for Safe Sport has, and um, we do take those cases back and handle them as an NGB. Do you know approximately how many are open still? Or, I mean, like, what's your rate of resolving them? Those are, no, I don't have that information in front of me. Okay. Um, they do get handled fairly quickly because they are um, resolved at, you know, more like the club, club level or organization level. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is um, for Ms. Colon. How would you characterize Safe Sports communications with victims who have filed reports of abuse with the center? I know that you have done, talked about some specifics, but how would you characterize it? I Tell me how you communicate with them. I'd say it's improving, um, but you know we haven't always been the best at communicating um, process where people are within the process or or results right of cases. And I think that's been kind of talked about um, from every one of the the witnesses today that we need to do more of that. So whether that is you know adding additional educational content to explain how we how we operate and our process for athletes on our website is that adding um, additional navigators to help people walk through those processes, uh, and also implementing more timeframes for uh, investigators, right, to make sure that they are communicating regularly when wanted, because um, sometimes athletes don't want to hear from us very often, mm -hmm. um, but giving them that opportunity and, and the ability to tell us, like, what they want as far as communication, which I think has been missing. Thank you. Um, my next question is, again, for Ms. Shim. What problems arise when Safe Sport doesn't inform you why they are administratively closing a case? I know you said people are upset, and or or actually they closed it against them, right? So what about when they don't when they administra administratively close the case? Yeah. So one one thing that happens frequently is that the respondent goes around telling everyone that their name has been cleared, um, which is not the case, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not a finding of no violation. It is an admin closure. Um, and it's really hard for us to combat that narrative. Um, and we just, you know, some of, some of the two-liners that we get are really egregious, sexual assault of a minor. And we don't have more information than that. So, I mean, I would say that the, the hardest thing for me is waking up every morning and knowing that there could be predators out in our sport and there's nothing that we can do about that. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, my next question is, uh, is for confusion when they are not given any information as to why a case is administratively closed. Oh, I certainly understand. It does make it difficult for them to make decisions, um, whether that is around uh, safety planning or if it's uh, membership decisions or employment decisions. Um, so, you know, we are working on that to make that, to give them more insight as to why a case was closed so that they can make better decisions on their end. Well, good. It sounds like, you know, there's a problem. You, uh, you recognize it, and so hopefully you both can all work together, all of you work together, and with that, I yield back. Jen Lee yields back and now recognize Ms. Kamick for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all our witnesses for appearing before the committee today. We're in the home stretch. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ms. Cologne. Um, in your report to Congress for 2022, you reported that you had 4,634 total resolutions, correct? Uh, maybe. It sounds right. I'd have to go back and look at the data, but probably. Okay. Um, but of the 4,634 total resolutions, you listed cases that you did not have jurisdiction over as a resolution. Yes. Okay. So in fact, of the 4,634 total resolutions you reported, 2,217 of those cases, you either lacked jurisdiction or declined to take the jurisdiction over, correct? Uh, maybe I'd have to go back and look at the data, but I can certainly confirm that for you. Okay. Yeah. I think my math's right on that. Okay. <laughs> but I just want to make sure. So 
it, it comes out that about 47%, 47.8%, nearly half of the reported total resolutions to Congress are cases that the center decided that they cannot investigate because of jurisdiction issues. So why are half of your total resolutions being reported to Congress as, quote, resolutions, so when by definition, nothing was resolved, and you're not even investigating or taking steps to resolve those cases? So I think it's important to distinguish between those cases that we decline jurisdiction and then those cases that we don't have jurisdiction, right? So a case that we don't have jurisdiction might be like a local high school. Um, and while we are not going through an entire investigation, we are referring that back. And so we do have to track that, right, for the federal government and for, and for others. For the cases that we decline jurisdiction, um, there is a considerable amount of work that is done in order to get us to that place. Many times in a declination of jurisdiction, it may be that we're sending that back to an NGB after we've decided or determined what the membership may look like, or after we've done an initial inquiry to figure out you know, what the details of that case are. So we do track that for that reason, because it's not as simple as saying, oh, we're moving this along, and we but, do nothing. But at the same time, though, I mean, that, it's, it's exceptionally misleading. I, at, at the oh. very least, you could say it is very misleading. I mean, that's basically the equivalent of a sheriff in one county stacking up another county's crime statistics and cl counting it as his own as, as as a resolution. I think even clarifying, I mean, reporting to Congress, it's it's a very serious matter. That right there should be clarified because clearly these aren't resolutions and they're being counted as such. And so this, the statistics and the data are painting a picture that is not accurate is, I think, the point we're getting to. So I think maybe labeling is a concern that we have and that needs to be clarified. That needs to be addressed. Um, and I guess moving forward, would you at the center commit to removing cases that you don't have jurisdiction over as resolution before reporting the statistics to Congress because it paints a skewed, a skewed picture. So that's what we're actually working on right now, right? So as part okay. of this top to bottom review, we're also taking a very close look at how we manage data um, and what those systems are internally to better be able to tell a story, right? Because at the end of the day, they are a lot of numbers, right? But we're not really sharing or kind of explaining well, like what a trend looks like. And so that's a big piece of what we're focused on right now. When will that be complete? It's a long process. Um, so right now, we just actually just hired a data engineer about mm, six weeks ago okay. um, to help us sort of uh, figure out where the issues were. And so we anticipate that that's probably like an eight-month process. So how about we say by the end of the year, this is cleared up? Because in Congress, people just like to work on things, and then it never gets solved. So how about we say at the end of the year, we have an actual definitive change in the way that these are labeled? We will do our best. We're going to hold you accountable to that. You, yes, you can hold me accountable for us doing our best. Yes. Well, <laughs> our, our best doesn't satisfy that, but we're, we're going to, we'll bring you back if that's the case. Um, I'm going to shift. Ms. Shim, thank you for appearing before the committee today. Do you have anything to say about the total number of resolutions that are reported to the center? And if cases does not take jurisdiction, should they be included? Can you weigh in on this? Yes, I share your sentiment that it is misleading, and it's confusing for us as NGBs, as well as claimants and respondents. Um, I also may quickly take this opportunity to raise another concern that we have, that we're seeing it, a trend, an uptick in what's called informal resolutions, um, which is another a, a path where they, the Center for Safe Support does not investigate, um, rather they call the respondent, and if the respondent takes responsibility and acknowledges that they um, may be engaged in misconduct or they are apologetic, that they will then um, close the case in an informal resolution, um, which in our opinion is not a resolution because there was no investigation. Um, and th those cases are concerning. Some of those cases are sex assault cases. Sound, sounds like the, the situation is ripe for some legislative action. Uh, we agree. Thank you. With that, with, with uh, that, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield. Generally yields back, and now uh, the ranking member and I are going to take a couple more minutes for questions. Uh, Ms. Castor. Well, thank you. Uh, and Ms. Kamek, to, to your point, there is a broad outreach effort going on to, to update the law. Uh, Representative Ross of North Carolina has uh, a bill, and I just, uh, to, to everyone here, all the NGBs, all, if you are involved, if you are interested in how uh, to keep athletes safe and that improving safe sport, uh, there is a broad outreach effort, and I encourage everyone to, 
to participate and contact our offices to, to relay your, your recommendations. One of the recommendations uh, from the Commission of the State of the U.S. Olympics and Paralympics um, was that safe sport should prioritize hiring investigative staff that are with direct experience in trauma cases. Uh, what is your view, Ms. Cologne, of that recommendation? So we have several staff, including investigators, that understand and have dealt with sexual abuse, sexual assault cases for decades. Uh, we tend to hire folks from local, state, federal law enforcement, Child Protective Services, Title IX. Many of those people are trained uh, to understand what trauma looks like. We could do a better job of making sure that we are more focused on that, but that is certainly a priority. Okay. Uh, then I'd like to get your to kind of close the loop on the centralized disciplinary database and the view uh, from all the witnesses on how it is being utilized right now, where are the gaps, and what would you hope uh, reform would bring so that, so that it's a meaningful uh, database and the public, the, the governing boards, all athletes understand how to, how to engage with it. Ms. Deal, what's your view? I'll start off by saying, I'll start off by saying that um, the CDD is a very useful resource um, for everyone in the movement and everyone outside of the movement as well. Um, for our background check policy, it's actually a requirement to check the CDD prior to hiring anyone that, who has authority over an athlete or interacts with athletes on a regular basis. So we utilize the CDD regularly within the movement. Um, what I have seen in the last seven years, the CDD is not, um, in other words, it's not evergreen. If someone has a suspension for two years, they are on that CDD for two years and then they are removed. So what we are seeing now are the different NGBs putting that evergreen list on their site. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the gaps of the CDD is it's not evergreen for a suspension or a ban. Okay, Ms. Shem? I'm sorry, Ranking Member Castor, can you repeat the question? The, the, how is the, the uh, centralized disciplinary database working and what, are, what improvements need to be made? I think it was a courageous thing for the center to do and it is very helpful for us, but I have a similar concern. Um, when a case is admin closed, a, a coach or participant who has been accused of abuse is taken off that list. And uh, there's nothing to show for it. And um, we think there need to be other measures to at least flag, right? People should know when there are reports against someone um, especially multiple reports. Thank you, Mr. Kress. Hello. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we find it a, a valuable tool as well when we're looking at it. We also work very closely with uh, USA Baseball just based on the fact that we feel that there will be crossover when the parents come, uh, maybe coaching their son, and then they have a daughter that comes up through the program. So we'll work with them to make sure that anything that may not be on that list was, is also shared with us. But we find it invaluable, and we agree that when they disappear, uh, it, it makes it hard for us to keep track of all of them. Uh, Ms. Cullen, do you want to address it? Uh, Absolutely, yes. And so I would agree that we, we also would like to be able to keep people on the CDD longer. We would require a legislative change to be able to do that. Um, I would also like to see other organizations outside of the Olympic and Paralympic movement make use of this more regularly mm -hmm. so that when we are banning people from sport, they are not introducing them into other sports programs across the country. Thank you very much. And I yield back. Uh, and, and I was going to follow up on that, and if we need a legislative change, I mean, that's why this is a, that's why we're not going to get a lot of attention from the media, because we're in agreement things need to be changed and improved, and we want to see that happen. Uh, I will ask uh, Ms. Shim in a, in a different vein than what we've been asking you. Mr. Kress has talked about these groups, and, and I've seen evidence of it in my region, where they're coming in and saying, you know, join up with our tournaments and our organizations, and you don't have to do you know, safe sport not required for diamond classic events. Uh, are you seeing the same type of thing starting to creep into soccer or no? Um, our members have certainly uh, expressed their concerns. And I mean, it's, it's also high school sports, um, college sports. A lot of coaches go on to, to do both, right? There's a lot of overlap. Um, 
And it's not okay that someone could be banned from the Olympic movement, but then, you know, go across the street and coach somewhere else. So that is definitely a concern. I, I, I hesitate to suggest that we expand safe sport to, to every youth um, program just because I don't think we're doing a good enough job as it is. And um, we've all cited a lack of resources. And you know, to expand their jurisdiction, I think it would be very confusing to people. And I also don't believe that the USOPC um, is responsible for all athletes of all ages, of all levels participating in sport. Um, that is also my personal opinion. US soccer is, we're talking through this because um, we, we have concern and we should all have concern about every athlete participating. It's not that we don't care, it's just that we need to ensure that we can, we can um, you know, follow up and make sure people are compliant because if there's no oversight, then what good is it? Oh, I appreciate that. And, and my last comment, uh, Ms. Cologne, would be that I was concerned, I understand it, but I was concerned, and maybe it's a communications thing that needs to happen between the athlete and your organization, where in some, I think it was Ms. Shim who said that there was a discouragement of, of talking about it uh, publicly because it might interfere with the investigation. I understand that when you're trying to get the facts and you don't want witnesses tainted, but there also needs to be a time limit. So asking somebody not to talk about it for two weeks or during the next month makes sense. Asking about them to not talk about it for two years does not make sense, which also goes back to trying to get things done more quickly. But, you know, once somebody knows they're under investigation, they're going to go out and talk about it publicly. I think the, the individual who has a complaint ought to be able to talk about it too, and I just somehow there ought to be a balance there. And I encourage you all to work on a balance where there's a timeline. We ask you not to say anything for the next two weeks publicly so that we can talk to the witnesses makes sense to me, but not open-ended while your investigation goes on when it may take two years. Yeah, I agree. There needs to be a delicate, there's a delicate balance between confidentiality uh, and sharing information. Yeah, and, and the victim ought to be able to make the decision as to whether or not they want to go public or not. That's a victim's right, in my opinion. I grant sometimes you want to talk to the witnesses before it becomes a firestorm in, on TV. Yeah. And I recognize that. Uh, I appreciate all of you all being here today, and thank you so much for your testimony. I see no further witnesses, no further members, excuse me, at wishing to ask questions of the witnesses. And uh, so I do appreciate you all being here. I appreciate you being patient uh, as we had to bounce this several months. It's an important issue. Uh, and I think everyone on the full committee, and particularly on this subcommittee, takes this uh, very, very seriously. And we're going to try to figure out how we can improve it both legislatively and otherwise. Ms. Shim, Shim, did you have something else you want to say? You look like you wanted to say one last word. I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, well, this is what we do, and it's, it's, when, we, it's when the legislation and the legislators work well is sometimes when uh, it's not a major controversial issue. We're just trying to solve problems. With that, um, I appreciate you all being here. I would ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the documents previously mentioned and included on the staff hearings list. Without objection, that will be the order. Pursuant to committee rules, I remind members they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record, and I ask that the witnesses, that the witnesses submit their responses to those questions within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. Without objection, subcommittee is adjourned. Man, it was nice to meet you in person. And I echo the comments about bravery.